It says going live. It's past, past tense. So, ooh, it looks like it's starting. Is the stream starting? Is it working? My hands are cold. I'm, I got a little space heater here. I'm going to turn it on for a second just so you guys deal with a little bit of noise so my hands warm up. <laughs> They're cold from washing them. So that's a good thing, right? It's okay to have cold hands if if it's because they're nice and clean. <laughs> so for those of you don't wonder, I have, this is under my desk quite a bit. It's my little space heater. Um, it's still a little bit chilly in Michigan, even though it's spring, but it's um, it's fun. So I was working on a project. Uh, I guess I could probably pull it up because you know we can talk about that first. Uh, I didn't grab any hot sauce though. I probably should have. What did we just order? You know what? I'll pull up what we just ordered because it's pretty amazing. So we have just ordered. Let me uh, go into the Amazon account here. Uh, wow. All right. Go through the orders. Your orders. I'll drag it over here in a second. <clears throat> um, da -dum -dum. This stuff is amazing. So out, out of I, I'm I'm full and I don't feel like eating right now. Uh, but this right here is super good. Uh, we just ordered a three pack of it off Amazon. So my recommendation day isn't actually a hot sauce. It's going to be a barbecue sauce, but it's Chipotle bourbon, which is a roasted pepper. So, you know, we're in the same category. We haven't tried their other flavors, but I will admit, um, we got two bottles of it. And when then we finished a bottle and a half of it in like just a couple days, so uh, we just ended up buying more. We found it at a local store, but the local store is out of it. We try to do, buy locally, but um, it's gone. So uh, anyways, this is my recommendation. So we will at least start off there uh, with the sauce recommendation. See, it doesn't have to be hot sauce. It's, I'm going to say it's a sauce recommendation. How's that? <laughs> so <clears throat> good time to be in IT. I don't know about that. There's some people really chilling out at home and there might be there's some nice cities of chilling out at home. Uh, so, yeah. Anyways. <laughs> mm. So, I was working on a project. Yeah, everybody in IT. Uh, we are still busy. Things are still moving really fast. Um, yeah, some people are working from home. Uh, my staff has the option to do so and is choosing to be here. So, I've been very clear on that. No one's obligated to come in. Uh, you absolutely can, and uh, they do want to be here. So I guess that's completely however they want to do it. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this. This is actually what I was working on, is uh, this project. Well, they were working on it. I was just making videos about this mess. But you can see we got all the labels on things, so it's pretty much ready to go, and I'm uh, doing a project video about it. So that's uh, – let me pop up the – map and we'll talk about it real quick this is not accurate this is me making a template these are not the numbers yet i gotta fill them all in because it's not service side it's actually going to be uh whoops what does this say so this will be site one and this will be Site two, and uh, these are going to be lab internet with public IPs. And this is the part that of the video I'm going to talk about. I should make these consistent. These are all the things when you're building this that you look later and go, oh, yeah, I just kind of typed that funny. Um, but we have two XG7100s. Um, they both have public IP addresses, and I have to list out they have a lot of private IP addresses as well. And what this is going to be for, move this over so I can see the chat as it comes through. As a matter of fact, I'll bring this one back over. <clears throat> um, the way this works is, is you can kind of see these two 7100s in here. We assign the public IPs that they actually will get, and actually this 5100 is feeding them. This is a 5100 we have in the lab right now. So uh, the 5100 feeds the two 7100s with their actual public IP addresses. So we have a public IP assigned to each one of the ports to match their network. That way when we deploy this, 
it's a drop in for the network. So we uh, put this in, we have the VPN set up and it's going to um, already have all the network tied together. Now all, this is where the cloud key is and the cloud key is set on top of these two switches and this XG7100 that's where it's plugged in. They adopt and go over the VPN from their other location. And we do this in the lab, that way everything is 100% tested, labeled, and absolutely known to be working. We make sure each network, because they actually have like five networks, I think, or four networks, um, that it goes across the network, that they can ping across from each one. Um, so it's pretty cool is uh, how all this co comes together. And that's what the video will go out in a little bit of detail when I do it here, but it's two sites, the WAN, WAN, and then I'll list all the unified devices down here. And then the unified controller will be on this side and this site won't have the unified controller, et cetera, et cetera. But this is how we, um, this is how we are going to be deploying this. That way when we plug it in, it just works. So you can self host draw.io. You know, I been a little while since I've looked at that one. Is it, draw.io mm. I think I played with this one there's a networking on here <clears throat> I've looked at this one it's kind of cool Windows installer, no installer, Google Chrome, Deb, Snap, App Image, or RPM. Oh, that's interesting. I remember looking at it a while ago. It definitely looks a lot better than it used to. Maybe I'll play around with it and draw it in this. I'm always trying different applications. Um, it's really about all the objects in there. It's making sure we have a good collection of objects. So a bit buggy, but works. I'm okay with that. So far, it looks pretty easy to use. And I, I'm a big, uh, I'm a big fan of things that are self-hosted and easy to use. The desktop repo isn't the self-hosted one. Um, Google Chrome, Linux, Deb. Huh. I don't know. Maybe I'll look at it. It looks pretty cool. I remember using it a long time ago because I thought it was cool how it all works in a browser. And I'm a huge fan of everything that works in a browser. Oh, Eric chiming in on that too. But nonetheless, uh, when we do these deployments, back to the, what we were actually talking about, the goal is because you want to rip and replace these at the same time. Uh, how can the firewall get internet access with the client's actual public IP address if it's at your office? That's the part that I figured people might find interesting. You can build this out and you can route the public IPs and I'll actually cover how we did that. That's the part that I figured people might find interesting. So I'll actually log in there. And what you do is you just have to build out their public IPs onto this device. It completely can be done. Now, they're not actually here. We do not have an ASN and a BGP route set up uh, with that. But that being said, the only thing that really breaks when you do this is these can't get to those IP addresses or that route at all um, because of that. And it's not transparent NAT either. That's different. This is us faking the IP addresses, which is different than transparent NAT. So we're faking the IP addresses over here. So it's not exactly the same as like a transparent NAT. I mean, you can do that with PFSense, but this is, this is simulating someone else's IP addresses in order to make this work. And that's uh, what's going to be kind of an interesting way to play the project. Because the goal is uh, when you get these firewalls, you want to do them at the same time. Um, and well, one-on-one -on -one mapping is still, we're not, we don't actually have their public IP addresses here. Uh, we simulated their public IP addresses here. So makes it pretty cool. Um, but this is be this is the deployment project video I'll be doing. I just want to make sure people kind of understand how we put them together. Uh, and how we keep things, how we keep these projects moving, that we, some of the planning, some of the back packaging and everything else, and away we go. What else was I going to do? This was the one thing, this was what I was working on before I started like a few minutes late and things like that. 
Um, we will talk about some remote tools in a second. But once we have this all labbed out, so we have this and this and then lab with uh, here, we should probably fix this lab with simulated client public IP addresses. So that's probably a more accurate description for how things work. Simulated public IP addresses, as in we don't actually possess that route. Um, we are just simulating them on our lab. Therefore, we can simulate the fact that it's online and this will allow us to get into the system in order to uh, do the tasks we need to do and have everything ready. So when we pull the trigger and put this on there and say, all right, here we go. This is going to be live because they do have site to site VPNs that they need to maintain. Uh, there'll be the absolute minimum amount of downtime. And this is one of those things that scale from an IT standpoint. Um, and so you have to make sure you have a clear way to do them. So yeah, two firewalls, no big deal. What about when you have to swap four or eight firewalls? The VPNs can take a lot of time to set up. And if you have to swap four firewalls, you want to swap them all at the same time. Well, you want to make sure that you have all this done because that way you're minimizing the amount of downtime. So uh, building out a scalable virtualized network in order to do this is absolutely, um, you know, a great way to do this. <clears throat> So, oh, thanks for the video on Zero Tier. This has been an amazing temp solution for clients who have and are waiting fiber installs. The only thing, and the only thing seller internet. So I'm going to do a couple more because they've been updating it. Um, uh, so there's going to be some new Zero Tier videos coming, especially, um, I probably have one done tomorrow. And the goal of the Zero, sorry, turn off my little heater. Uh, the goal of the Zero Tier video is going to be that I um, will, oh, crap. He wears paperwork behind me. It's, it's just papers. I hate papers. Anyways, uh, got distracted. That's why I don't like them. So uh, I will be doing some zero tier videos because right now zero tier is one of those quick and easy solutions to get things deployed. Uh, so I know it's going to be a popular way to make things work. So I'm going to do just a handful of how do you get this going on zero tier type things. So some use case scenarios for people. Because right now that's obviously something critical is being able to... Um, be you know get remote access quickly and everything else oh <laughs> i'm just laughing at what my wife is sending me right now so i'll actually pull it up because now i have to see it and uh she's wrong so what is it at it's only at 394 we're uh we were me and friends were, were uh, looking at stocks and projections right now so it looks like they may have it's not down as much as she said. I, I said I, I didn't get in, in time. I wanted to buy at 363. It went back up to 440, but it's coming back down, but it, it's still not as low as it is at 363. So sorry, that's uh, one of those. One day, maybe I'll do more videos or maybe have my wife on. We'll talk about money a little bit because a lot of people ask about that sometimes. Um, it's important that any money you make that you are uh, conserving it and uh, doing smart things with it. But right now when the stock market is doing this, there's an opportunity to... Um, ride it out anyways uh back to the thing here someone asked they said do you have customers connecting to aws with a customer gateway yes uh matter of fact pf sense has their own aws wizards uh so you can do things like set up um that let me pull up and uh drag it over here So I think I have my the other labs turned off, so I got to pull it up in this one. Let me see what network is it attached to. There we go. I'll log on on this. Um, yeah, they have actually an AWS wizard in PF Sense, and it will allow you to uh, connect to the AWS senses and, and Azure as well. I believe they have a template for both already set up. And this is something so you can do bridging with there. Now, this is also where things like they're new, and I'm not super familiar excuse me, super familiar with it. I got the hiccups. Um, but the when you go to, and we're going to go over here to NetGate, netgate.com, um, they have their new uh, Tensor product. I believe it's pronounced Tensor. I'm probably saying it wrong. 
Uh, this is for some of the scalable cloud infrastructure because in this cloud or AWS or Azure, wherever you're deploying this, you're not limited by you know a one gig or a 10 gig interface in the same type of manner. And you need something that can flow uh, and do packet flow at even higher speed. This is why they have this right here. Uh, I've been talking to them and learning a little bit more about it. So I may be doing some videos on it as a topic because a few people had asked about it. It's a pretty impressive product, but it's also... Um, it's all you know, command line only, but it's very purpose driven because it's vector packet routing, um, and it's for people that have needs that scale beyond what you can buy for uh, right here. So, something to consider for sure. All right, now we can log into this. So this is three dot one five two five two go in here. There we go, and I believe, let me see if this is in here or not, in a package manager. I'm trying to remember if it's in here or if it's only in the, uh... oh, that's interesting. You know, actually we can do it from here. So let me go here. So make sure I have to make sure there's nothing pulled up here. So I have to do 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 any public information. So I get to the package manager. There we go. This is my SG eleven hundred at home. Yeah, right here is the PFSense AWS VPC VPN connection wizard. So they build in a wizard to their products uh, to do that. So for what it's worth, that's kind of an interesting side note to what they have in there. So uh, hopefully that makes sense. So yes, you can do it. Yes, it's there's even a wizard to make it uh, easy to facilitate. So uh, where else do we? Oh, and a scroll back here. <laughs> uh, let's see. Where did I leave off? So William Dottery, thank you for the donation of that. So uh, thank you very much for the donation, forty nine eighty five. So much appreciated, Mr. William Dottery there. So thank you. And uh, did I get a lot of requests recently for at-home office capability? Yes, we're still dealing with that. I'm getting more and more emails about that kind of as we go. There's still people contacting us like that are not managed clients. There's managed clients. A lot of our managed clients, one of the reasons they contacted us was to do this. So that part's a little bit less of an issue because our managed clients, they already have our packages and everything else. They're, they already have it. So uh, not as big of a deal. But as far as new people, yes, I feel uh, people who go to our website and do the hiring part of us, they reached out and I, I replied to some more people today. And a matter of fact, I'm not going to pull it up because it's got client information in it, but I can probably look. I think there's probably a few more because I noticed a few more contact uh, forms. Let me just see what they are. I bet they're exactly. One more home network and uh, that one's just another consulting job. So, yeah, this is definitely a uh, something people are asking for a lot more. So for sure. Uh, most VLANs I've ever seen on a network box, probably a hundred. I don't know. I've seen some really, um, I've seen some really big ones out there. Mm. Cool. Um, so the, um, sorry, I got distracted. I turned my phone off. My wife fussed me again about stuff. I'm going to turn, I turned, I muted her. So anyways, uh, I've seen some very large VLAN setups. I've seen a lot of big configs, uh, not really, uh, you know, 
not really an issue. Um, you can build it. Matter of fact, what they did was rather clever. They downloaded, they built a couple of the VLANs along with all the rules and everything. And then they went and scripted it and re-uploaded the script back to PFSense. So you download the XML file, re-script it, upload it back, and it rebuilds all the networks. So uh, there's, there's ways you can do it without having to do the repetition of doing it, I guess you could say. So kind of cool. Um, any recommendation on a single sign-on identity service that's not AD? Google, single, and Geo, sign-on. Google has it. So you can set up uh, Google's single sign-on if that's what you're looking for. I, I think you guys ask this every time. I'm, I need to make a video about single sign-on so I can just fire it off of it uh, and, and send it off to people because I think this is like a beat up question that gets asked on every single live stream. I want to, you know, add single sign on. They also have uh, SAML support and things like that in Google. So if you don't want to use the um, the other ones like the uh, Office 365 sign on or the Azure sign on, you can use this as well. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, I'm going to kill off on this topic. So. <laughs> Uh, OpenVPN throttling, we faced this issue, tried to change ETP, but still no resolution. I, you, can, you can't you can have OpenVPN any faster than you have bandwidth for. So you have a combination of bandwidth and processor speed. If you don't have those two things, you're either going to run out of speed uh, because too many people are connecting, or you're going to have a processor not fast enough to handle all the connections. You got to buy a bigger box. Uh, that is a problem people are running into. They suddenly want to ramp up and we're like, hey, no problem. You're going to have to put a bigger PF sense in. You're going to have to put more hardware in in order to support it. That's not, that's just, there's no easy or workaround for it. Same thing with bandwidth. If you only have a 10 meg pipe and you have 20 people connecting, 20 people are sharing a 10 meg pipe. Those are limitations. You have to get faster internet connection. So we are running into those problems, but they're not, they're not unsolvable. They're just, just not a workaround. It's, it's kind of saying, I need to carry a hundred pounds, but my truck only carries 50 pounds. What's the solution? <laughs> Fill all the use on the rack. Yeah, that's true too. Uh, I'm unique situation adding domain to do both Office 365 and G Suite. That sounds like a headache. It's usually one or the other. It's a pain to try and split them. It's not impossible. There's ways around it. You can even proxy mail to two different domains. It's not an insurmountable task. It's a, it's an aggravating one. It's a, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it, I don't know what to say about that. So that's, that's going to be one of those things that um, if you want to split them, I don't plan to do a video on it because I, I, I have had... Uh, it's been years since I've done a split email domain. You can do it by what I believe you can even do it in PF Sense. You set up a, a email proxy, so you can actually have a, a proxied emails. And what it'll do is you can have it I'll do matching based on domain and then forward on to whatever mail server should be receiving it. We actually years ago we had clients that were split up like that. That was interesting because they had internally hosted mail servers in the plural, but only one domain and. Um, they wanted some people's email to be on another box and some on this box and there was all this confusion. So we put a mail proxy in front of it and it would proxy back and forth the way the mail would work. It's something that can be done. I haven't done it in years. So it's, yeah, it's kind of a one-off use case. VPN server in the cloud and do a site-to-site uh, -site back to your office. Yeah, there's, there's all kinds of fun things you can do. Um, lots of options, but obviously, that can create its own challenges if you go to the site to site and then bring it back to there. Um, now you have more traffic routing going in different ways and there's a challenge. Now, I just released that video on how to work from home using some of the open source tools. And one of my favorite ways, this is what we do here, is we use SyncThing. And the reason we use SyncThing, and let me pull it up here. So two, three, nine, that should be one. We'll go here, there we go, LTS graphics. And um, which one's this, 239 or 240? 40 will have revisioning. So many servers. I don't know the password to this one, hold on. Not authorized. 
Do I know? Do I, I think I know the password. Let me find out. Oh, good. I do know the password. I forgot to say the password, but I, I thought I knew what I said it to because it's not in production yet. Really. Well, it kind of is. There we go. Versions. So I'm a big fan of this. This is so much nicer when you're doing it with um, SyncThing. And one of the nice things about SyncThing is it doesn't restrict me to bandwidth, but still gives me access to all of my files. And this is like when you're offline sometimes, like if I'm using my laptop and I got to create a diagram, I got to save some data to it. I know as soon as my laptop is back online, it will sync. Now, the one challenge when you're doing this is one is if I edit a file and someone else is simultaneously in a file, but we're not on, we're not both online, well, now we have a problem. And even if we are both online, if we edit exactly the same time, it'll have to create a conflict file and we have to figure out whose version is newer. So there are some disadvantages to doing this way, but some real advantages are, I'm not restricted by the bandwidth, I'm not restricted by the VPN, and any of my changes I work on are gonna be instantly saved. So for example, I was editing that diagram file. So that diagram file now is right away sent over to um, my documents folder and synchronized in all the locations where it needs to be synced. So as this gets synced across to these locations, I instantly, that little edit I did there is gonna be available at my house. So if we go over here, um, let me follow up with this real quick. Now, do, 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 do. Um, yeah, most of the traffic egress in the cloud, just download more RAM always makes sense. Uh, yes, having enough storage for full data sets, obviously that's going to be a real issue with saying thing. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm only keeping my entire graphics folder and you can see what I'm updating here. The, uh, LTS video live stream. Yeah, I mean, this is only 2.48 gigs. Uh, my business documents is uh, 1.5 gigs across my whole company. The server backups are gonna be a little bit more. Um, let's see what's in there. Uh, yeah, they'll, I got file names in there that I, okay, I can pull it back over. So it's not a huge deal for me because it's, just not a ton of data. It's all together 14 gigs worth of data. So there's just not a ton in here. But yeah, obviously this does have a scaling problem because each workstation has to be able to have whatever you sync. Now, the advantage of sync thing is you don't have to sync everything. You can sync like a subfolder. And uh, we have some design people that have used it where they're only syncing the projects they're working on because they have to swap back and forth. But it, it kind of is a stopgap measure uh, to get that working. Obviously, uh, this is not always the most ideal solution, but sometimes for some people, this is a good solution that works. It keeps things backed up. Now we use this for our server backups because uh, we take snapshots of the data, not the entire VM, because the VM doesn't change much, but we do snapshots of the data that changes and the databases and drop it in sync thing and it syncs to all the offsite locations. But that's happening every 30 minutes. So every 30 minutes, there's another file update and we keep the revisions of the old files. So I can always go back a few days worth of them right now. And right now one just got kicked off again because it's at the top of the hour. So now it's synchronizing and then it sends it off site and it's gonna synchronize it to the off site location. Yeah, send prunes <laughs> so it doesn't get backed up. <laughs> Tom. Uh, Titanic Sync. Oh, I that's a good one. I like that name on Titan Titanic. I do like that. So, to give you an idea, though, let's go. Uh, let's go somewhere. Where do we have this file at? Let me think. So, if I go here to LTS Graphics, it's going to be. Actually, I need to go here. Oh, I'm not running Sync thing. I got it. I got it shut off. Let's open. Let's. Uh, I actually. Do this. I do not have sync things starting at startup, and that's I, on purpose. Um, so I start it like this, and it just drops it off as a background process. And here we go. It's going to synchronize with everything and line up. So now, whoops, not the business docs. This one here, and we'll go here. So if we can't test that text, some text changed 
And if I go here and say if I uh, let's see the test.txt, this changed. I'm working on some new thing, sync thing videos as well. That's why we even got this file here. Change some more. All right, I save it. Let's open up another window. VPN connect. We'll SSH to my house now where the, whoops. Uh, it's gonna be under sync thing data. Yes, graphics. So it's already synchronized from my computer to the free NAS here. And purple NAS is the NAS at my house. And I'll be diagramming all this out, how it all goes. Uh, but now it's absolutely changed it. So this one, I'm at home. And this one is locally on this computer here. And if I make a change to this file here, it will instantly be changed over to here. Uh, so so you vim, actually you gotta do vi because it's in free NAS. We'll insert uh, changed from the purple NAS. All right, we just wrote that out. So if we look at the file here and then fairly quickly, it's waiting to sync. It's now gotta go cascade back this way and it'll change it back the other way. Yep, now it says change from a purple NAS. So it changes within a few seconds and this is going across three versions of sync thing. So sync thing running on my computer, then sync thing running on the free NAS here locally, then over the VPN, over to the purple NAS that I have, uh, which is my NAS at home, and it now synchronizes it. So you can see how quickly in seconds I have these changed. But of course, if we change simultaneously at the same time, whoops, a, we just have this test text. So we vim test text and uh, insert changed from LTS computer, but I haven't hit save and we hit vi here. From purple NAS changed, uh, we'll use the word insert more from the purple NAS. And I'm gonna hit the, get them ready at the same time. So I'm gonna hit, uh, we got the W ready, so we hit the W. And let's see which one wins. Because now we have a sync conflict. And there we go. Now we have two different ones because now it's going, no, they're wrong. Which one's the real one? So it creates a sync thing conflict because they were saved ex close enough to the same time. Uh, so you can kind of get the idea. This is where sync thing does have a problem if you have a lot of users using something, if, they, if each user is writing at the same time. And they both have the sync conflict in here. So easy way, easy solution for now is we're, we're gonna get rid of that. We'll RM test and we'll get rid of these. So we only have the one in here. And away we go, they for the most part are in there. So you kind of get the idea of how that works. Uh, yeah, telecommuting, telecommuting is uh, the way to go on this. But this is why we use sync thing for the most part for our use case. And actually a lot of people, it, it varies by, you know, based on use case, you find the right tool for the job. The nice thing about loading something like this is the simplicity of it. You know, they have a local copy of all their files. It'll synchronize, they have access to them. And if they have a handful of people in there and they didn't have to deal with Dropbox, they didn't have to deal with all the problems that you have with Dropbox where you're running out of it. So if your team doesn't have a lot of external storage needs, it works really well. For a lot of our businesses though, they're using OneDrive or they're using G Suite a lot of our commercial support is in that realm. So this is kind of a one-off thing more so than the standard. The standard that we do, if you ask me what would happen for most clients, they're gonna be on G Suite or Office 365. That's pretty universal. We almost have no clients that are not on one of those two platforms. That platform is like 99%. Actually, I got one client I can even think of that's on Rackspace, one. That's it. 
Um, they just have so many email addresses. They don't want to bite the bullet and pay that much. They like G Suite, uh, but they're not ready to pay for it. Uh, it, it's it, they're they're debating about it and they're really thinking about it, but they have like uh, I don't know if it's a hundred or 120 users. And they don't want to pay the bill um, for 120 users, but you know, it, it's one of those things that maybe they will, maybe they won't. I don't know. Um, Nextcloud, that's another good option. I like Nextcloud quite a bit. My challenge, what I don't like about Nextcloud, um, well, one, someone said version 18 is cool. Yes, and in, I'm going to talk about this from, this from the standpoint of running it in FreeNAS and where my challenge comes in. So this is running in FreeNAS. I've got it set up in a GL right here. So right there is the Nextcloud. And if we look at the plugins, this right here, version 17, let me move my head out of the way. So version 17, installed instances one, and not version 18. You would have to do a manual build to run this inside of PFSense. So if you run it inside of here, and this is what a lot of people do, they want that one click install, they want it to work. Well, if you didn't notice when I'm logging in over here, it's not logging in via HTTPS. So there's your first problem with it, is without it being HTTPS, with it all being HTTP, well, it's not secure. Second, it is it is updated because they are still updating the 17 version. It should have all the security updates, but it may not. So if you're running this inside of FreeNAS, um, you run into the problem of you may be out of date. And what I get is people going, hey, can I just publicly expose this? I'm like, you are opening your company up to risk because you're probably installing it through this because you don't know how to manually install it. And if you don't know how to manually install it, you are at the mercy of the people updating it. And this is a big challenge for people. If you're at that mercy all the time and there's a big problem, a flaw found, you've just got all your company files pwned. And this has already happened once. There was a, a flaw found in Nginx. They, yes, they fixed it. Yes, they updated it. Not before there wasn't a ton of ransomware uh, deployed on people with publicly exposed ones. So yeah, you have to lock it down pretty good. And it's not just 2FA because the flaw didn't require, the flaw that they found in, zero, in, in Nextcloud did not require that you had access or credentials. There was a way that was how the exploit worked. So what you don't want is to have this public facing. That's one of the reasons we don't use it. And I see someone mention using Nextcloud HTTPS with zero tier. There's a great solution, zero tier or a VPN, either one of those so you're not public facing. That's the big part. If you don't have it, um, Public facing, you've minimized the risk. And this is a really important factor when you're setting these up for any of the remote things you're doing. You want to mitigate the risk of where's your threat surface? How can you reduce it? How can you minimize your exposure to it? So that's that's already what you want to make sure when you're setting these up. It's not that I have any problem with it, but it's one of the reasons we don't deploy it. And because I don't want to support it, um, it's why I don't usually install it for clients. I don't think I have I have one potential client that kind of talks to us once in a while because they need help with it, but they're also really they don't want to spend no money. And I'm like, well I don't know what to tell you because it's time consuming to maintain because someone else built it and they want me to reverse all the stuff they did and figure it all out as they put it. They don't have any documentation, but someone helped them and built a Linux server in the cloud with Nextcloud on it. But it's not up to date and I have no documentation to make sure they set it up right. So they're upset with what we want to charge to audit it and maintain it. And I, they said, well, this isn't saving us money. I'm like, well, that's kind of the thing. It's so inexpensive. They're a four person office. Setting up either Office 365 or G Suite is pretty cheap. I suggested they go to the hosted version of Nextcloud if they liked it, but they don't want to pay for the hosting on Nextcloud. They just want to pay as needed and pay for updates. And I'm like, this is just not good. <laughs> so um, it's that's the reason we don't have a lot of clients using it. So it's not that I have any dislike for it, but these are some of the challenges you run into on there. Oh, uh, let's see. Manage Clam AV with a graphic interface. I am not sure. I don't know. Um, never tried. I, I never used Clam AV. I haven't used it in at least... 15 years, maybe longer. It has been forever since I've considered even using Clam AV. It's such a 
I don't know. I don't know how good it is. I have no idea how good the detection rates are in it uh, or anything like that. So I, I don't have even a good, a strong opinion on it. It's not something I use at all. So I don't know. How good is it? I have no idea. So uh, clam AV comparison. It's been around for a long time, but I, uh, do, 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 where is the stable releases? Does it have a release history on it? Two thousand seven. Okay. Well, that's when they announced on that it had acquired it for Clam AV. So it's it's pretty old. I don't know how good it is though. I know it's. I just know it's been around for a super long time. Uh, twelve out of nineteen for higher rating. So okay, cool. Um. In 2008, it wasn't rated very good. I I don't know. And it's really, really hard to spend any time testing any of these. So oh, it looks like someone wrote uh, Clam TK. So Clam TK, for, the, for those of you, there's a uh, GTK interface on top of it. I have no idea how well maintained it is, but someone asked the question. So <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I think I'd seen Clam AV back in the early email days of Linux mail servers. And I used to do Linux mail server administration. But once again, just not something I even see a need for anymore. Like no one really asked for Linux mail servers to be set up or configured anymore. They're they're very one-off-ish type things. Not particularly popular, I should say anymore. So can someone recommend a good reliable NAS for my home office? I would say free NAS is a good reliable NAS for your home office. So mail cow. What is mail cow? The mail server with some moo. Well, that's cool. Build tests updated. Yeah, I mean, if you want to host your own mail server, there's a couple companies out there. It's just, we, I, I get rid of my mail servers. I just don't want to maintain them anymore. I don't need anything uh, publicly exposed. I don't need any of that. So um, it's, not something I need. To me, the email war is over. Uh, if you're looking for something more privacy oriented, is it Proto Mail? I know that was popular. Obviously, mainstream is going to be Gmail. Business is G Suite or Office 365. So, uh, budget, go to, um, if you're looking for really cheap budget ones, the cheapest ones are probably going to be the Synologies. Synology makes some really inexpensive uh, NASes. So I, the, uh, you can pick up the, the, I don't know what size you're looking for, but I've done some reviews on these. You're the one bay. Um, 179. Right here's a two bay one, 297, and they're pretty full featured. I did a couple of reviews. Here's a two bay one for 178 uh, without the drives. So, you know, the, there's options when it comes to uh, building some reasonably budget NASAs, but I don't know what budget means. It means something else to run everyone else. So, have you had trouble joining the latest free NAS to an AD domain? Um, we have to do some testing. Someone said there's some issues with 11.3. I, someone said, I don't, I wish I could remember someone had commented on, I think one of my videos. Uh, but I, we don't, the clients we have are still running 11.2. So I have not tested because we, we just haven't gotten around to update them to the 11.3 series. So I'm going to do some testing. And this is actually something we're working on here. Uh, one of the reasons we got the new, this one here. The Dell R630 local storage server is, uh, I want to run some Windows VMs on there, so I need something with horsepower. And it's completely for labbing things out, and we're going to do some testing on there. So um, that's going to be uh, a future video. We're probably going to put server 2019 on here. And once we have server 2019, we'll be able to uh, go over and say, all right, this is the... Um, how we join FreeNAS to it. So that way we can do it with all the latest. Plus we need the lab for some testing we're gonna be doing with FreeNAS because before we move 
my clients from 11.2 to 11.3 that do have this, I want to test it in the lab first with one of our free NASs that are 11.3 and join it to AD and make sure it works. I think I have a free NAS AD video, but it's old. Um, and the 11.3, and of course, going forward with 11.3, because they're going to be doing it as true NAS core with the merger, um, there's going to be some updated videos. As I already noticed, uh, when you look at the next cloud here, I like the way they did this with next cloud. Um, let me go over here. And if you look at the plugins, they put the post install notes and the credentials and everything are actually right here, uh, where to get in, where to set the settings and stuff like that. So um, I wanna make a new video because I think they clean this up so much in 11.3 and the install goes a little bit nicer. Uh, I will be covering how this works. And I, I thought it was a great job they did on, on the setup for this in the latest version. So definitely pretty cool here. And of course I like this because they have the community plugins versus the other ones. And I think this is odd because I don't really have a use for putting OpenVPN inside of PFSense, but I guess the use case probably comes down to you would do this because you want to have access to local resources on your FreeNAS remotely, but you don't have a firewall with a VPN capability. Um, and you know, even if you're not a PFSense person, even if it's insert name of 20 different firewalls, so many of them have OpenVPN capability. Um, I guess there's exceptions, and this is why they put that in there. Obviously, it was enough demand for it, but it's a community-supported plugin, not a direct IAC system one. So hopefully that makes sense for um, my babbling on all that stuff there. So what else do we got? What else do we want to talk about? Oh, I thought this was interesting. I noticed that net data... Uh, was in here as a plugin. I haven't tried it at all. But I just found it interesting because they took it out of the actual system but then put it back as a plugin. So that's kind of interesting. They also put Drupal in here, which is kind of cool. So they got that. Um, what is this? Okay, that's part of the Sonar thing. And Home Assistance Core, HomeBridge. I, I just don't use um, IoT stuff. And very few of our clients ask for it because the clients that are talking about IoT, we met with a client the other day about it. Um, I mean, we have a client that has us bidding certain things they want connected, Some, but it's their equipment they already have. The house is like 12,000 square feet. It's a big giant mansion with a bunch of ornate stuff that needs to be done. And they usually don't want some budget system. When you have the money to to build a 12,000 square foot house, you have the money to buy some of the highest end expensive crazy stuff. So uh, different different type of clientele. We're not usually looking to put something budget. We need something that works really well and usually comes with some type of support. Well, let's see. Stable bit drive pool on Windows, though use and duplication, it's not RAID. Windows 2019 identified SolarWinds RMM as 2003. That's weird. I don't think I've seen that before. Maybe I, but I don't look at that. So when I say I don't think I've seen it, I should say I have not seen it because I'm not the one that stares at those details my staff is. So they, they're in the RMM all the time actually looking at that. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, but I do like this Dell R630. I just did the review on for those of you that didn't do it. Does anyone have questions about that Dell? That's been kind of a fun thing to play with. Where is it at? So, I'll be finalizing all the install and moving this over into full production tomorrow. I've already got it joined into the domain. Um, and I may do some videos about that topic as well, how to take things and bring them in and take them out of the domain uh, when you're joining stuff for the... Uh, XCPNG, virtual console, host storage, virtual disk. The, the right performance on this thing is stupid fast. And I want to do a video after this Saturday when I'm done migrating everything. Um, it, it'll be something in there. Uh, will I add QSFP to the R630? I don't have a need for it because the R630 has um, SSD. So everything it needs access to that is going to be at scale or at speed is going to be running on those SSDs. So it's not really likely that I'm going to be add on there. Um, 
How loud is it? That's in the video. It's like 50 decibels or something like that. Uh, power wise, because right now it's not running much, but let's look here. So if we go here, is it under hardware? Power. Um, maybe not there. Or does it show the actual wattage? I found it yesterday. System performance, no. Oh, power thermal, derp. It's right here in front of me. I'm tired. <laughs> At present, we're using 98 watts. Uh, so idling, it's 98 watts. Let's go ahead and uh, fire something up on it like this, which is running locally on there. Uh-huh. Let me get my daughter something real quick. So one second here. One second. Sorry about this, people. Family needs some stuff. I have uh, two daughters on the front line of this epidemic, so I'm always tentative to what they need. There we go. Six, eight. She needed a number. I got her a number. There we go. All right. So we have this all booted up. Actually, I just need to know the IP address and we'll ask the stage into it. And this is uh, 194. All right, so we'll SSHN. At 19. All right, and we can just do a quick, what do we got here? We did speed test, what kind of write? This is a real raw, just dumps a bunch of data. So you can kind of see, um, we got 818 megs a second write speed on these. So you kind of get an idea for just how fast those drives are on here. Um, if I need more storage, it has 10 gig. Everything's hooked up at 10 gig on this, but it's uh, it's not super necessary. Um, it's not, you know, it's, I'm going to, for as much storage as we need, which is very little to run the company, this is going to be plenty fast enough on here. So... Yeah, the uh, the kids don't need coffee. The kids are both nurses. They they work in medical, so that's what I when I say front lines, they work as uh, medical professionals. So, I well actually I have three daughters that are medical professionals. Um, one is currently um, not doing that stuff because they take care of elderly, so they're the opposite, like not exposing. And uh, then my other two daughters are uh, front line um, at the universities. So, anyways, not to get too off topic on any of that. Um. Someone said, please do a video in adding host. I brought HP 360 for my home lab. I had another Intel CPU machine, but I could not get it to my host, uh, which was NAR 710. It's actually pretty easy. And I have a video on, on how to build a cluster. So that covers how to host. I have one that's called Jump in a Pool, called Building in Pools uh, inside of XCPNG. So I've covered that as a video on there. But I will talk about how we do systems integrations um, uh, on this. But you're kind of getting an idea here. And if we pull up, I think I probably have. Uh, we can, I forget, is it this one? Yeah, I have a couple little scripts here to give you an idea of just what kind of IOPS this can run. So, so this inside of here, and this is where I know it's caching and I'd have to do some uh, more tests to get exhaustive caching. But from the internal perspective here, and caching is relevant because you do cache some of your read writes. We're showing 74,000 IOPS inside of here on, a, on this uh, random, uh, random write process. So you can see th these drives, these SSDs in the 630 are absolutely outstanding. Now, the other thing we can do, do I have stress on here? Yes. So if we go stretch dash C, um, let's say eight processors. 
So we just kicked off stress for H processors on here. And what you're going to see, you'll watch this get peaked out here in a second. So there's that. And let's go over here. And in a second, this, let me refresh the page. It'll take a second to catch up, but it's going to start stressing the amount of wattage used. Uh, we currently deploy Sentinel-1 to clients for antivirus. All right, we'll go to Power Thermal now. And now we're using 140 watts just by pulling eight CPUs in there. We went, we're, we're, just by testing, we caused a 40 watt jump in the usage of the system. And I'll go ahead and hit Control C. So it kind of gets you an idea of how some of that works. And I may do some videos breaking down that. It's kind of interesting when you look at it, uh, you know, just running commands on here will do it. But once this is fully has all of our main system VMs on there, I'll do an update. Because right now with barely anything, the only thing running on us right now is Zabbix. Um, it just hardly uses any wattage at all. Right now, it's only like I got one thing running on it. So, but uh, you said very reasonable. That's because we don't have that many CPUs assigned to it. So we've got four CPUs assigned to this, and we look at the host itself. We've got forty-eight CPUs available. So if in here, why not? Why not do this? Because it's not doing much. Because um, all the other load, as you see, is running on my 720. So if we go to the 630, we uh, let's stop this one. And we put in um, 32 processors. So now we have 32 processors available for this. We'll fire this up. So now we took 32 out of the processors, added them in here. I have a video already on how I do P to V migrations. I've done a video specifically on that topic already. Um, you, I just use the Microsoft tool for P to V for Microsoft. I'm gonna use Clonezilla for non-Microsoft uh, devices. So this is almost done and away we go. Boot it up. SSH back into there, HTOP. Look at all them processors in here. So now we got lots of processors to use. So now if we run stress again, and we'll say, let's stress uh, 32 processors in this. And actually, we'll tmux this, split the screen. We'll put, uh, All right, and we'll type in stress dash C 32. And here we go. We pinned all 32 processors in here. So you get the idea that, yep, it's busy. And uh, then we go back over here to the iDRAC and let's just refresh this page. Oh, and it logged out. And let's see how many watts we're using now. We're probably warming up the back of the office. <laughs> back over here to our power thermal. Oh, not that much more. So it's only another 14 more watts. So not bad. Uh, Sentinel-1 does not sell, have pricing on their website. You have to buy Sentinel-1 through uh, a commercial reseller. So, and you have to negotiate minimum seat prices and things like that. So, um, so it's, yeah, not too bad at 150, but we're gonna stop it because we're just wasting electricity at this point. We'll watch all the processors calm down. We could probably watch if we trade, if we watch the thermal on this, it probably starts going up, how many BTUs it's using, everything else. Because it's like, hey, normally we're only doing this, and here's this little peak where we suddenly ramped up. As Tom was playing with processors, and then and 
and oh, actually, at present reading is 224 watts. So it actually kept, it was still going up. It was just uh, taking time for the iDRAC to catch up with it. So yeah, we use quite a bit of wattage there. I'm sure the, the server's uh, fans probably are singing a little bit in the back, but you gotta get the idea of how all that works now. Um, so how many wattage you use really depends on how loaded up the system is. That's gonna be where the real challenge is on any of these. I don't need that running in Tmux anymore. And that's even with virtual machines. I generally don't keep any running unless I need them. So anything you see here, this is our things we need uh, that we're running and things like that, like Bitwarden and stuff like that. And uh, honestly, here, if we go over to hosts and we look at the 720, we don't really, I mean, it, in average day here, I mean, it's hitting over 25% processor usage, but it's not that much. So, um, Am I a commercial reseller? We're not a direct seller. You can't buy Sentinel One from me directly like that because you don't get dashboards. Uh, if you buy it as a full, you have to buy a you know several hundred seats or whatever to be a full reseller. I think with the dashboard, I don't know exactly what the rules are. We get it with Solar Winds, so we buy it not even direct from Sentinel One. We buy it as a Solar Winds package. So we're getting Sentinel One via Solar Winds um, as part of our RMM pricing. So it's all integrated uh, for us. Um, that's, you know, that's the way we buy it. If you, the only way we sell it, we don't even sell it just as a service to our clients, but as a package to our clients. So we sell it as part of our RMM tool. Um, and if you want to hire us to do all of your RMM, we do have some minimum seat requirements, but yeah, we do remote managed um, MSP work. And we, that's part of the stack that we put on there, which is SolarWinds, Huntress, and all uh, Sentinel One and a handful of other little tools and things like that. So. It's something we do, but you can't just go and buy Sentinel One as a one-off. And if you're doing a one-off, like if you're just a individual person, I recommend using Microsoft Defender. It's really good uh, for consumers. I think it's one of the best antiviruses out there. Um, Tesla Powerwall? Not really. I don't. I. I mean, I slightly considered it but what i'm actually thinking about doing is more likely building our own i like the tesla powerwall but i also like the kind of the diy there's a guy has a wonderful youtube channel and he breaks down um how he does all of his stuff he's got some homemade power walls and things like that and it's within because my electronics background and building background um completely something i can do <laughs> there there's when we had only a few cpus there's when we had all the cpus <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's completely within the scope of things I'm familiar with doing and comfortable with doing. So it is something I thought about uh, doing as you're building my own. Or so there's a few places that sell kits that are not Tesla's actual kits, but they're of the same design. And um, I thought of it might be kind of cool to get something like that for our building. It's on my to-do list. It, it is very likely something I will um, get in the future. It's not on the short list. Uh, but maybe before uh, summer, it might be something I look at. So we'd end up with a couple days of power to uh, uh, run our company, provided there was some major outage. Um, IDRAC over zero tier is probably possible, but would take... So there's different ways to configure uh, zero tier. Zero tier is not a VPN. I covered that in my video because what zero tier does is the ideal use case for zero tier is to access a singular device but it does have routing capability. So if you turn on routing, you can get inside of a network and then pivot to the other devices. So you, there are ways to do it, uh, but ideally more of a zero tier scenario is gonna be load zero tier on your laptop, load zero tier on your desktop. Now, when your laptop and desktop are on the same network and you want to access, let's say RDP, you can access RDP from your laptop when you're away from your desktop without having to do any special VPN configs. That is a really simple and ideal way to use uh, the zero tier system. But yes, you can load it on each of the devices that you want. For example, um, FreeNAS, I believe still has zero tier support built in, so you can load it on your FreeNAS box. And this will, is a way to give you remote access uh, to your free NAS box without having to VPN. But there are some 
and I haven't tested it lately, but I want to test it again because they've been going through a lot of iterations to update things. There are some firewall concerns that you have with it, not as much the security, but in the latency problems that you may run into. Um, so I'm going to do an updated video on that topic and cover how to get around some of the latency problems that you might have because of it. So that's... Uh, that's about it for the zero tier thing. Like I said, I'll probably do a video on it because I know they've updated it. I love the product. I think it's great. And it's it's one of those, it's unique, but it really scratches an itch for a lot of people to do. The things, the, my only downside about zero tier is you have to rely on their control plane. So zero tier works by uh, UDP hole punching, but the way UDP hole punching works, you have to have a central authority that knows where it is. Now you can spin up your own control plane um, that you host in the cloud. But that's a little bit more complicated because now you have another layer. It's not just loading it, which it's one and done loading. It's dead simple. They did a great job, but it's more complicated because you'd have to set up your own hosting for it. Um, and they've done such a nice job on their hosting. It's easy to use their hosting for it. But, you know, some people are like, well, now you have to trust their control plane. And that's that's where the challenge is. That's where VPN, you're controlling it top to bottom. As long as one of them static, you VPN, you know, I, I VPN from here to my house. And from my house, I can VPN here or really anywhere. I can VPN back into my office. The OpenVPN is a well-vetted, although somewhat convoluted, complicated protocol for those asking why not. XYZ better VPN, like uh, something like WireGuard. As soon as it all passes code audit and gets kind of mainstream, WireGuard is going to be an awesome replacement for OpenVPN. I live in March of 2020 where OpenVPN is still king because it's been audited and I trust it uh, and it's well integrated into things. So soon we'll use better VPN software. For now, we're using OpenVPN and it, it's a solid connection. It's low latency. It's a excellent performer. It's well integrated into a lot of products. It just works really well. So hopefully that answers uh, that and all long questions. So have you seen the new update and Unify app for AR with the Gen 2 switches? Um, I think it, someone said, and I have not even tested this because it's so something that I don't care about. <laughs> I think it only works at iPhones, if I'm not mistaken. Am I, someone can correct on there. So um, the, uh, what is this? Oh, open Source Enterprise VPN. Distributed I, OVN IPsec server, huh. Interesting. Most of the time for us, we're using um, we're just using PF Sense boxes so frequently for so many things that OpenVPN itself is fine. So this is cool that they have something else that provides something a little bit more robust. Enterprise distributed OpenVPN and IPsec server. So that looks kind of interesting. But uh, like I said, we're, most of the time we're sporting that mid and small business market. So that's where we see more of the ones that we have there, which is why we have so many PF Sense in there. Matter of fact, we and we have some larger clients, but they all run like a full cloud app. So they're, they don't even need VPN at all. Every worker, it's like some of the, inter, the insurance industry, everything's a remote session that you can remotely manage with a headset on and you don't need to log into anything special. So they don't have a need for VPN at all because they never have the VPN back to the office. They just have to be able to log into all their uh, applications that are all hosted in some enterprise servers. Yes, if you have double NAT because you are stuck behind a uh, provider that will not give you a public IP address, yes, that's, that's where zero tier can solve problems for you for sure. Yeah, that looks like, like I said, it looks like an interesting product. Uh, how'd you say it? I, I, I copy pasted. Is it pre, pre tunnel or pry tunnel? How do you, you know, I mispronounce things all the time because I read it and I'm guessing it's pry tunnel, but I don't know. Um, cause I, I, they almost need a pronunciation for things. So you know how they're said. So I'm, seems like pry tunnel seems like a good idea. So yeah, pry is in private. That's why it seems like a good idea. Open source, get started.
Oracle Cloud Install, Enterprise Clusters, SE Linux. Amazon Linux, CentOS, they have a Debian, Debian Stretch. Oh, cool, they got Buster in here and everything. They got a proper, oh, it runs in Mongo, ugh. <laughs> Mongo's okay, I don't hate it. They have a demo on here. This might be a fun thing to play with. This is kind of cool looking. Simple single sign-on. Oh, they support uh, Google Sign-On, too. That's cool. Azure Active Directory, Slack. That's pretty cool. Looks like a neat product. We will uh, later. <laughs> Uh, PF Sense in HA mode. Is it hard to set up with SG5100? And hello from Italy. How are things in Italy? Hopefully getting better. Um, no, HA is the same to set up on really any of them, whether it's a 5100 or it's uh, a whatever one. I, I think I even have a demo where I set up um, HA and is, did, I, did I do one on SG11? I know I did 3100s. I remember if I did 1100s as well. So. I don't think it matters which one you use, 5100, 7100, whichever. They're all really good for uh, HA. HA works great in uh, PFSense. So I really like it, but you have to have the IP addresses available for it. So um, my HA video, I covered that. I covered one of the, you know, the, the upside downside to doing it. And uh, because of that, it's a... Um, it's it's kind of a no go for some people if they don't have enough IP addresses. As I had someone who says they have enough IP addresses, but they want to use all of them. I'm like, well, then it's not HA at that point. You know what I mean? It's only HA if you um, can use only the IP addresses that you can assign to the uh, VIP part. If you need those extra ones that you have to sign to each one, well, none, nothing that gets assigned to those is the HA. So go through my video where I break down more about what that means, but that's gonna cover a better understanding of the ups and downs and good or bad for their, you, you, need, you need a minimum of three public IP addresses uh, to get HA working. So that's where the challenge may come in for some people, that minimum of three. Um, there's someone who's wrote a workaround of doing it without using three, but it's still kind of a workaround. Uh, it's, I don't think it's probably the best setup. It'll work though. There's a way, there's a hack around way to make it work. It's not the officially supported way, but if you type in like HA on uh, without multiple public IPs, uh, you'll find a forum post where someone did a write up on like how to work it around. Not, not like I said, I, I prefer to do things the proper way. And we have very, very few people that really need HA. It's, uh, I, I mean, everyone asks, I think more people ask about it than actually need it. The devices themselves are super reliable. Um, they're not really a problem in terms of failure rates are really, really low. So my usual recommendation is just buy two of them and you're, you can keep, matter of fact, you could do this even, you can set them up almost HA where you synchronize the settings between them so you have a hot spare and it does require some manual intervention where you just move over the cable to the other one. That is a way to do it. You can actually build the HA all on the back end, but the front end, because you don't have enough public IPs, it would require that you actually physically move the WAN ports over but you can keep them in sync. There's there's some, like I said, there's a couple workaround ways. Uh, so you've minimized your downtime. Like, hey, if the PF Sense fails, plug it in the other PF Sense that has been synchronized with all the settings. So um, there's methods. But that's only if you don't have public IPs. If you have three extra public IPs, go ahead. You can build an HA. Uh, obviously, the private IP is not really a concern other than if you have weird mappings because uh, you do need to use the same thing. You need to use three for each LAN that you have set up. You need to use three private IPs. One's going to be the gateway and the other ones are assigned to um, the PF senses themselves. And I cover that in my video as well of how you break that down and how you get that set up. 
So what other questions do people have? Because I've just kind of, I've run out of things. Well, I've kind of not, kind of sort of run out of things to babble on. I mean, I can babble on forever, but I want to be more concise. Other questions, comments, concerns uh, as I wind this down and reach the end of my day, because I'm actually pretty tired. <laughs> I'm exhausted and I want to make sure I keep my strength up because uh, there's still work to be done. <laughs> Any questions or comments? I got 184 of you, but only 28 likes. What can we do about that? Um, I like the idea of, yeah, the hot spare. We keep a hot spare. Um, we're using all the IP addresses and, and the different blocks given to us. So we just have a hot spare. We um, have an, I, and well, a warm spare because it's setting in the rack, not plugged in. But being as we're technical people, if the PF Sense were to die, I have an extra PF Sense that's identical. I have a NetGate 5100 and I have another NetGate 5100 um, and we have a backup copy of the config file. So we just upload config file and replace. Really easy. We're all technical and capable of doing that here. So it's not as big or deep of a concern. That's what that's what we're doing is I, we're, we'll call it a warm spare because I don't even have it set up to synchronize at the moment. So hopefully that clears that up a little bit. Um, let's see. What else do we have in here? Yeah, I know MariaDB is not the same as MySQL. There's, uh, no, power's off. I actually, we purposely leave the power off. That way if a surge were to hit things, um, it wouldn't hit it. So we have it unplugged. Um, that's it's not a big deal. It's got 90% of the config and we always, anytime we make a change to our PF sense, after I make that change, whatever that change is, uh, we download the config file to our backup folder. So we always have the latest backup. So if any given moment, the PF sense fails, and this is the same policy we have for our clients, um, process procedures, everything. When you, when we log in, a client says, Hey, I need this changed on my PF sense. No problem. We go in, we make the change. Uh, once we make the change on it, we download the config file. Once we confirm the change is working, I should say, we know that we're done, which is usually, hey, can you open up this port or some minor change that needs to be made or add another VLAN. We make the change, we download the config, we add it to the client's config files uh, folder that we have a backup of. So we have a backup of the running config in case anything goes wrong and away we go. Um, I have a video I'm doing about we had uh, it, it's the first time ever we had a NetGate device appears to have failed. So we sent it in for RMA. They were very fast about it. And what I'm going to do is kind of a debrief is I like to talk about if there's ever been a problem with the product because uh, sure, it's one of those things that things can go wrong. To me, the example of a company is how they handle it. So I'm going to talk about, uh, I can't remember, I don't think I did one, but I will do one on Unify pretty soon. We had a Unify. They were awesome about replacing it. Uh, we've had, you know, not because we're us or anything like that. We go through the same RMA process that anyone contacting Unify. We filled the form out, said the device is dead, and they shipped us a new one right away. We've been really, really happy with Unify about that. And this is the first time ever, ever that I've had a PF Sense go bad. And uh, their process was pretty pain free and everything else as well. We gave them the logs, we showed them what it was doing. It was really weird. And uh, they decided right away to replace it for us. They were really cool about it. So um, let's see. Do, 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 do. Uh, what are you going to do with the 10 GPF Sense box you had? Do a video about it. I actually, um, Supermicro wants to send me some servers, and I'll be doing a video about Supermicro and their servers and um, as a firewall. Uh, it seemed like a kind of a fun video. So, yeah. Um, I should do mini videos just to talk about various self-hosted things you play with. I kind of do sometimes, uh, but my better, the reason I don't do too many one-off videos on it, it almost has to be something I use or I'm not going to do a good job on it. Um, if it's not a product I use, I won't really, it has to be really interesting to me or something I actually use. That's when I do a good video on it because my video is coming from my use case experience. So because I use it on the daily, for example, Bitwarden, my Bitwarden video would not be interesting at all if it wasn't for the fact that I actually use Bitwarden because I'm using Bitwarden. I have really, I've, oh, matter of fact, um, one of the dev people from Bitwarden reached out to me. So I'll be doing, um, 
I'll be doing some probably more videos upcoming. And by coincidence, they reached out to me and we're going to talk about some of that um, because I, I set a bit warden the video. They said, hey, thank you very much. They thought it was really good. I, you know, I like it too. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm biased. I like my own videos, right? Uh, anyways, but they talked to me about it and I told them I'm going to work on some videos and they, they've shared it out and things like that. So this is kind of why I did a Bitwarden video. Um, so the other stuff, if I don't use it though, yeah, it just becomes much less interesting at that point. Uh, the only thing I noticed about Bitwarden, it's not much, but it does use a bit of processor power when we're doing things a Bitwarden. But my overall, uh, we are still really happy with Bitwarden and I may do a... Um, I, I would probably do, maybe I want to do a direct comparison because I realized there's a couple things that I liked maybe a little bit better in LastPass, but they're really minor. I do in the big picture like Bitwarden better, but there are some, for business, I think Bitwarden works better. For personal, LastPass, I still recommend it to people, but LastPass, because of the way you can one-off share passwords is a little bit different. And I think maybe more, um, a little bit easier for end users versus Bitwarden. We love the way it works. If we have a password we need to share amongst us, we just say this password belongs to the uh, LTS collective and boom, or collection they call it. Uh, you put it in the LTS collective and boom, it, it, everyone has it instantly. There's no notification. There's no uh, waiting for someone to accept a share. It just doesn't. Now, LastPass on the enterprise does do that. So they do have some feature parity, but you have to buy a different version of LastPass. So um, how much more secure is PS Sense over Untangle? I don't see a difference. Um, they're they're both really on top of security. So I haven't had any problems with Untangle. They seem to stay up to date very well. I haven't had problems with PF Sense. Same thing. Um, people assume because PF Sense has a long time between updates, they are quick if there's a security problem. But just in a general standpoint, yeah, if there's not, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Not until there's a new version out. And uh, they work uh, methodically and carefully. But that's something you kind of want out of a firewall company is that. So uh, either one of the companies, they're both, they're both good on security. It's, I, I, would, I don't have a problem with either one. Uh, I have the Unified Security Gateway Pro 4. It does have VPN options. They're limited, but it does have them. So it the, the VPN options are super limiting on the um, USG. I don't know. They're kind of, that's where they fall short. So uh, YPF says fails the Fortuner test. I don't know what that means. Yeah, almost 7 p.m. I am. That's why I am. I, you know, lately I've been waking up a little bit earlier, but my ritual in the day, and I said one day I'll do a day in a life of time. Uh, one of the things that I do is uh, I'm up every morning like clockwork between 4.30 and 5. Um, 5 is the latest I wake up every morning like clockwork. But I also sometimes stay up late. Uh, so on some days when I've been running more and we've been busy, by now I'm actually just kind of melting in my chair and ready to go to sleep. <laughs> I, well, actually, I don't really go to sleep. I, I'm uh, Decision fatigue is my favorite uh, term to use it. As a business owner, at some point in time, I've been asked so many questions. I literally, um, because you guys ask me questions is different, but it's when I've had like a mass amount of questions between staff, customers, and everything else, because you're running the business and keeping everything going. A lot of it is just decision-making and, and pushing direction. You end up at some point kind of just exhausted. And what I want to do is watch Star Trek. Um, I, I, I'm a big fan. I'm a big Star Trek nerd. And the Picard is really scratching an itch. Uh, I'm enjoying it. So that's actually my plan after you guys are done is uh, go home, me and my wife, watch Star Trek. And uh, so that's Star Trek. I'm trying to remember what else. Oh, the new Westworld started. So uh, that one too. So I'm, I'm uh, Westworld. Oh, I loved all the first few seasons. Um, the new one started out strong. So, and I like that it's got, I can't help it. I want to call him Jesse Pinkman because I liked uh, Breaking Bad, but so that's really cool too. So yeah, so, uh, that's about it. What else do we have? Too much swearing. Yeah, they, they, I, I feel weird when they swear in Star Trek. Like, I don't mind swearing in movies, whatever. Uh, colorful expression is fine. Um, it feels weird hearing anyone swear in a Star Trek. So, so, uh, yeah. 
Voyager. <laughs> it's just weird seeing swearing in Star Trek. It feels awkward. So sma smash the like button while we're talking about Star Trek. Smash it twice if you like Star Trek. Well, actually, no. You have to smash it three times because if you did it twice, it'll unlike it. So I, I didn't think that statement through. Anyways, give me some more likes, guys. It helps the YouTube algorithm. <laughs> And what did Tesla close at? Because the market was still open. So I think when I started, oh, no, the market was closed. So we closed at, closed at 427. We're going to be discussing this when I get home. We're predicting after hours trading of 388, 463. So, okay. Um, what's, because uh, I have a few of you still here. 280 of you here. Wow. Uh, yeah, the actors seem like they don't want to swear it feels forced. I'll go with that. All right. Um, uh, Picard 9 here is tomorrow. Okay, cool. Uh, I was going to work on an accounting video. And I don't know, maybe it's a different audience that comes on my live show that would watch this. You guys have an interest in how my back end accounting. Someone's, I've done an old video on it, but it's like from three years ago. It hasn't changed much, but uh, I may... Um, I may do an updated accounting video. So, because people ask like, how we do numbers. I don't mind talking about the business side of things because I think it sometimes provides value to people understand how some of the functionality of business works. So they have a better understanding of it, of how we run things internally, uh, how we actually present the books and how we work with the accountants. And um, so, yeah, you're here because you love the vlog, but I don't know if the vlog people are the same people that watch accounting videos or maybe the accounting video is because I would talk about some of the books in the back end attracts a completely different crowd of people. But I think maybe a few of you are business owners. How many of these 200 something people that are on this live stream are business owners? So I think that's that's the audience that probably um, uh, your wife. Is, so, yeah, there's in I'm obviously relating it to tech. So it, it's more relevant because someone um, running an MSP in another state had contacted me about whether or not I could tell them who my accountant is. I said, well, I don't have a problem saying who my accountant is, but I don't know how helpful they'd be because they are very familiar with laws here in Michigan and may not be familiar with laws in other states. So ideally, you want an accountant that's familiar with your local laws because each state does have some of their own uh, laws that are very specific. So the, while I may have some things about specific ways this is run and I can easily generalize those because there's not too much when it comes to what I plan to talk about, the state laws don't really come into play. Uh, whether or not you pay certain amounts of personal property tax is going to vary based on where you're at and what the state regulations do for personal property tax. But to me, personal property is just something I file. Um, so it doesn't really make a difference there. Yeah, so, and that's the cool thing about YouTube videos. Uh, they're not episodic. You can you you can just skip around all my videos. So if you if you say Tommy an accounting video, and I have zero interest in that stuff, all those numbers look confusing and not interesting in any way because they're not a VPN or firewall. I'm fine with that. Um, I actually see though um, what helps me as a business owner is understanding some of the numbers, is understanding some of the accounting. That helps me understand the business. And the reality is there's still formula uh, formulas very much in a way that formulas are for mathematics as they may be for anything else so the concepts are there um in the eu now you're talking a big difference because i i've been told um i've been told that there's some pretty steep accounting differences in the way things have to present uh be presented in the uh eu so that you know what i almost want to uh i i did talk to one of my friends I may do a live stream with uh, from overseas and I wouldn't mind getting some input because I think that's kind of an interesting topic to talk about the differences in the way business filings are um, because the U.S. has a lot of things that are very different than other countries I found out from my German friends. Uh, I didn't realize just how much different the way employment taxes work in Germany versus the U.S. Uh, I'm not an expert on it, and they aren't. A, they weren't a business owner, but they were just kind of give me a general overview, and I found it really fascinating how much different we function uh, in relation to things. So there, there's, it might be some interesting topics that I think spin off of that, and it's you know it's interesting to me, and maybe interesting to a few people here. Um, Bitwarden Premium License is great. Uh, we did buy 
uh, the Bitwarden premium licenses. Be, we had to buy them uh, even for the self-hosting. If you do the self-hosted Bitwarden and you want certain features, even though it's self-hosted, you want the higher end features, they do have a license for it. And someone will point out, yes, this isn't it open source? Why are they charging fees? You could go recompile the code if you wanted to. Uh, it is your, you know, if you want to host it, you want to recompile it and you want to remove the licenses, you can. There's someone who's probably wrote an instruction how to do that. Um, but I don't mind paying because it's so inexpensive. We're a business. This. I don't mind supporting the project. So my personal recommendation is to do it. And they're self-hosted for a handful of people. Like if you just want to run it for maybe you and your family or you personally, you don't need a license at all for that. So um, I, it's not a big deal. And it's not, I, I don't, I don't, I think it's worth it completely. Um, and I think their pricing is very reasonable on it. Matter of fact, uh, Bitwarden pricing they're actually pretty upfront about all of their pricing. There we go. The enterprise, $3 per user per month. It's for the level of quality you get and the fact that you get support with it uh, for on-premise loading, audit logs, API access, MFA dual secur security, it's cheap. <laughs> it's, um, it, that's, uh, a, that's a lot to get. So something to think about. And uh, there's the premium. They got some options there. But yeah, it's it's definitely pretty cool. Uh, let's see. Pay your devs. I do pay my devs. <laughs> Should drag this chat over here so I'm not staring off to the side. I'll put that over this. So what do we got here? Uh, malware detection on PFSense firewall. You don't do malware detection on the firewall. You do intrusion detection on firewall with like Sericata. So, um, yes, you can do Bitwarden with OpenVPN, which we do, and you can use uh, HA proxy to wildcard cert it so you can have a self sign instead of having a self sign cert you actually have a sign cert for your domain and it works perfectly fine over open vpn uh bitwarden doesn't use much traffic at all so open vpn works really really well for it it's not it's it's not a challenge to use at all it has acme but if you use the Acme protocol to do it, you're going to be publicly exposing it because it's expecting to be public facing. Um, so we use it through HA proxy, which by the way, works perfectly fine. Talk about racks, dongles, and penetration testing. That'll be a future video. We're winding this one down because I got some Star Trek to go watch. So I'm going to go watch Star Trek. Thank you for the likes. They got all the way up to 55. If any of you have the strength to do it, uh, I'm going to be doing some new videos on Snort because I haven't done a video on Snort in a couple of years. So look for a new video on Snort. Um, uh, do I need to do start, stop OBS? I started an OBS and then I hit start over here when I click stop. I don't know. Um, I've always clicked start and stop and end stream separately. Maybe they have some way to link them together. I've not really played with it much. Smash the like button. Uh, is there an easy way to update your public IP in DigitalOcean? That's a, um, I don't know exactly what you're asking. Yes, I, I plan to, um, that's a more of a DigitalOcean question, I think, because if you're asking, like, do you change the public IP of your DigitalOcean? So, I don't know. I mean, you can, there's ways to do it, but head over to the forums and keep continuing the conversation here. I do my best to try to participate in the forums all the time. Uh, and... Hopefully that makes sense. So cool projects coming up. Yes, I'll be talking about the one I had at the beginning of the video. And I'm going to, I'm waiting for drone permission uh, for another one. So I'm waiting for a client to allow me to fly the drone on our property. We always ask permission and we want to make a video about a job we just did for them. So, um, so there is that coming up. And I want to do a video about my Tesla and the wrap on it. Um, so... Do you want a sneak peek in what that looks like? So 
fun story here. Let's exit and we'll pull this up. This will be the last thing I pull up here. Uh, pull that up. I'm waiting on Xavier. Xavier's been extremely busy with what he's working on. So I can't really answer when he's going to be doing the next uh, how they got hacked. That's kind of an Xavier question I don't have an answer to. So what are we going here? So we need to go view, load layout, one screen. And uh, this is kind of the rap video that I'm, I, I think it's funny because it's called a rap video, right? <laughs> that makes me laugh every time I say it. But it's some of the time lapse of how they put the wrap on and uh, how my car looks. So I'll be doing a video on that topic because I want to talk. People ask me where's, when I'm doing some more Tesla videos, or they're on my to do list. But this is what my car looks like right now for those of you that didn't know. So, and this is all done in 4K. So that's going to be kind of interesting. So, this is how the editing looks when you're doing it. I filmed this so long ago, it was in the fall, I just haven't had a chance to actually uh, edit all the video. It's just all sitting in the archive right now. <laughs> so, uh, load layout, three screen, there we go. Hopefully that answers some of those questions. Yes, it's a whole reflective lap, so. <laughs> uh. Hey, some people hate it, I'm fine with that. It's certainly noticeable. So that's that's the part I wanted. I wanted something that was very visible. So um, as I know, it's not for everybody. That's a given. And I've already had comments. There's people who love it. There's people like, what the hell? And uh, I like both responses. So I'm fine with that. All right. Well, I'm going to get out of here. Thank you all for joining again. Um, thank you for smashing the like button. And I'll see you guys next time.